Come on, Papa Brown. Mother's Day is a day of great emotion. We know the Bible to say that we are to honor our father and our mother. And the Bible says with a promise that life may go well for you and that you may enjoy long life. And yet, today is a day of emotion. Many are happy to celebrate with their mothers and be together and spend time together. And, and yet it's also a, a day of profound loss for so many who have lost a mother, who have lost a mother figure, or possibly did not have a mother with them growing up. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for the hearts of all those who are part of our congregation. And uh, I, I, I today especially appreciate Aaron McCray, yeah. who uh, walked away for a time but was restored to the Lord a short time back. And, uh, and today he brought, of his own accord, several uh, red roses. If you have lost a mother, or a mother figure, or did not have a mother in your life, uh, there's a bucket of roses here in front of the podium. Uh, red roses so that you can take them to a grave or, or say a prayer um, and honor your mother. Amen? Amen. 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 Of course, the world says, behind every great man is a greater woman. <laughs> Amen. One day. And blessed is the One man day. who, as the great woman of as a mother in his life, and a wife who was a mother in his life. Today I'd like us to focus on, on three, uh, possibly four different women. Uh, the first is, is Hannah in 1 Samuel. Uh, the second is Jochebed, Moses' mother. And I also want you to focus on your own mother, or mother figure. If you did not have a mother today, you are blessed to be in the presence of many mothers yeah. who will love you like their own. Yeah. Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Of course, God wants all men to understand mothers. And especially the love of one. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, he says, We were not looking for praise from men or from you or from anyone else. <clears throat> That's just, you know, the heart of a mother right there. <laughs> Moms don't look for praise. They don't look for praise from their husbands or from their wives, from their children, or from anyone else when it comes to their own children. He says, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. Today, I, I hope that you walk away from this service, having grown in your mother's love. I hear, I hear especially so many young men that want to be the man. Come on. Sorry. I'll deal with things. I'll handle it. And, and yet, moms always know best. Why do moms always know best? Because there's nobody that knows what to say to their child when they're hurting or in distress or when they need to persevere like a mother. Yeah. I'm blessed to have in, in my life a, a wonderful mother, uh, my mother Judy. Who I can say exudes every quality of a motherly love that I've ever read in the scriptures. And I'm blessed to have my, my beautiful wife, who's also a mother. Fantastic job helping raise our sons. 
They get everything fun about them that came from my life. <laughs> the boys learned how to work from dad and learned how to enjoy work and enjoy life from mother. <laughs> There was a story that I read that I thought was fitting for today um, that, that really tells the story of getting out of touch with our mother's love and getting back in touch with her. A man stopped by a flower shop and ordered, a, uh, ordered some flowers to be wired to his mother for Mother's Day, who lived 200 miles away. As he got out of his car, he noticed a, a young girl sitting on the curb soft. He asked her what was wrong, and she replied, I want to buy a rose for my mother. But I only have 75 cents, and the roses cost $2. The man smiled and said, come on. Brought her inside, and he bought her the rose for her mother. As they were leaving, he offered the girl a ride home. So now we know the story was probably written in the 70s. <laughs> 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 she said, yes, please. You can take me to my mother. And as she directed him on where to find her mother, then they ended up driving into a cemetery. Where she walked in and placed the rose on her mother's grave. It was a freshly dug grave. So the man left from the cemetery and returned to the flower shop, where he canceled the wire order, took the bouquet, and drove for 200 miles to Otto's mother. <laughs> Cry every time we're in. <laughs> it's so important to learn how to honor. Yeah. I think the reason there's always so many tears is one of the profound gratitude that we come into touch with on these days, but also we come in touch with how much we have, we did not love. And especially when a loved one is gone, there's a tremendous guilt that can sit. Because we think because my mother is not here, I cannot honor her. And there's nothing further from the truth. Come on, bro. You learning the lessons that your mother had to teach you and carrying them on to pass them to your children yeah. is the greatest honor mother Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Moms have many quotes, but they try to teach us these things. <laughs> Someday your face is going to freeze like that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. They know how to teach us to not be people pleasers. Oh. Well, if everyone jumped off the cliff, would you do it too? <laughs> they teach us how to be safe. <clears throat> You're going to put your eye out with that thing. Don't put that in your mouth. You don't know where it's been. <laughs> Did you flush? <laughs> One of my favorites. Why don't you let me be the mom and you try being the child for a little bit? <laughs> the people pleaser thing, moms are not people pleasers. I don't care what everyone's doing. I care about what you are doing. <laughs> if you can't say something nice, don't say it. <laughs> then we have heated moments with our moms, and some moms pipe out and say, I hope someday you have children that are just like you. Of course, there's the don't talk with your mouth full. And, uh, Am I just talking to hear myself? <laughs> I'm going to give you to the count of three. <laughs> and then we go through that why phase in our life. Why? Because I said so. That's why. Right. <laughs> But then there's those 
special moments. You can be anything or do anything you want if you just set your mind. There's no greater impact with that statement than when it comes from all. And then last but not least, my all-time favorite, there's nothing like when mom says, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> See, all mothers envision greatness for their kids. They don't imagine anything other than greatness. Try and get a mom to believe her kid is not going to do something great. And yet, uh, that's exactly what they teach us. How to be great. That's the title of our lesson, Teaching Us Great. Teaching Us Great. But all too often, all of the energy put into all this teaching goes right over our heads. I'd like to look at four brief things that mothers teach us that thrust us into greatness. The first is, our mothers teach us to be able to comfort people like God comforts. Yeah, yeah. Go to Isaiah chapter 66. Ooh. Isaiah chapter 66. Oh, Isaiah. They teach us to comfort like God comforts us. We'll be in Isaiah 66, in verse 13. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. And you will be comforted <coughs> over Jerusalem. <coughs> Many of us refuse to be comforted. We feel we've been wronged or, or life is unfair. We feel entitled to something that we don't have. And we refuse to be comforted. Nothing anyone says can get us back to that childlike heart. And yet, don't you like being comforted? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it great when you're hurting? Or you're feeling depressed or insecure? That someone enters into your life and comforts you. See, comfort... <clears throat> is the key to getting to people's hearts. Why do you think mom knows best? Because mom knows how to get to the heart. <laughs> See, you cannot do anything great in this world if you're unable to comfort. If you're unable to get to the heart of men and women. When I was, uh, when I was growing up, um, and even to today, I, I suffer from migraine headaches. And uh, one of my most vivid memories of growing up is our green rocking chair in our living room. And I would have my migraines, and I could be in my room for hours in an agony. Cool rag on my head, all the lights off, and just in agony. But you know, there was something about when my mom would sit down and call me over to the chair, or oftentimes just pick me up and carry me over to the green, little green rocking chair, where she'd hold the rag on my head and massage my head, and, and, and just, it was, a, it was a different thing. And I would always fall asleep. And all the pain that I was feeling would dissipate when I was in the green rocking chair. Moms know how to comfort. Yeah. She, she could say anything to me during that time. And I'm all ears. <laughs> and, we, and if we want to win this lost world, oh, if we want to change this lost world, because <clears throat> certainly when you become a disciple of Jesus, you become a fisher of men. Yeah. 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 It is your mission on this earth to fish for souls. Yeah. Yeah. But a soul will, be not, will not be caught if we can't get to the heart of that soul. Yeah. 
Wow. Turn to Second Corinthians. Chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. We can get so faked out about the heart of God. Yeah, come on, God. We can confuse power with wrath and not comfort. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, isn't it interesting? He has a reason why he comforts us. <laughs> so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Yeah, come on. So if you refuse to be comforted, then you're not able to give comfort. Which means you will only be passing along information. Unable to get to the heart. Yeah. He says, For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into <coughs> our lives, make no mistake, we, we suffer yeah. like Christ suffered. Yeah. We just don't respond the way that He responds when we suffer. <laughs> The sufferings of, of Christ flow over in our lives. So also through Christ, our comfort overflows. Yeah. See, it's not enough to say the right things and, and quote the right scriptures. Be able to accurately account things that happen. It's not enough if we cannot take and give comfort. It is Jesus' way. He says in verse, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. Tough things happen to you. They cause you to feel distressed. So that you can learn comfort. Come on, bro. So that you can then give comfort to others. Wow. <clears throat> I remember when our son was sexually abused by one of his teachers when we were in D.C. And this is the scripture that we read at the, at the, at the press conference. Of course, the news cut the scripture out of the news. <laughs> they only want the hate and the anger. And all those things. But when someone talks about, I'm in distress, but God is going to comfort me, and I'm going to give others comfort, they don't want to put that on them. Right. Come on. That doesn't sell. Nope. Fixing the world doesn't sell. The world being in chaos is what sells. Yeah. I love what he says about his hope. In verse 7, he says, And our hope for you is firm. Because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We give up on people so easily. We give up on each other so easily. And you know, there's, there's just something that changes in the communication when you give up on somebody. It becomes harsh. It becomes hard. Because there's no comfort. There's no hope. In the tone of the voice. Or even in the things that are said. See, mothers comfort like God because they never lose their hope in their children. They never lose their hope in their children. <laughs> Can you imagine if there were no troubles, if there was no need for comfort, 
what you would miss out on in your life. <laughs> See, mothers teach us with their example, without words, oftentimes, how to comfort like God. It would behoove you today to take that great lesson. Because that's one of the first steps to greatness. Yeah. Is taking and giving comfort. Yeah. Just like mom. Secondly, let's turn to 1 Samuel. Come on around. First Samuel chapter one. Our second point is the heart of Hannah. Sacrificing like Jesus. See when we lose hope. We lose clarity in our communication. <clears throat> we listen to every word and we listen for con condemnation. We miss the heart of those around us. And yet I, I think many miss this story of Hannah. Because I think many focus that Hannah wanted a child. Not many children. See, back in, back in Hannah's time, you didn't just have one child. You had many children. We can forget, as we read through the scriptures and speak of the 12 tribes of Israel, it was one family, it was 12 brothers. It's a big family. And so we know when a, a woman who was barren was longing to give birth, it was not just a one child, it was many children yeah. that was desired. And I think we lose the point of this story if we don't understand that. Because it's a story of great sacrifice. In verse 1, I mean verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. In bitterness of soul. Because that's where we can be. In our hardships. We can feel alienated. Typically when we feel alienated, we alienate ourselves further. And then we blame because we feel alienated. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much. And pray to the Lord. Well, there's the way out of the bitterness right there. She made a vow. It's another way out of bitterness. Saying, oh Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery. I can imagine she's just weeping. Sobbing with this prayer. Yeah. And it, it is the place that she's in is the place that we get to when we're bitter. We think God actually doesn't see our suffering. Yeah. If you'll just look at my bitterness. Sometimes we just got to hear our own words at times. <laughs> <laughs> my misery. And remember. Of course, that's where you always get God's attention. Yeah. Save me. Please remember me. And not forget your servant. But give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord. For all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. See, typically when we pray for things. It's that we receive them and keep them. And yet that is not Hannah's prayer. Yeah. If you will give me the joy of being a mother, I'll even give my son back to you. 
Awesome. Of course, for someone to be given meant their head would not be shaved. But that also she would not see him. She would not be there when he fell and cut his knee. She would miss those moments of being able to give comfort. It just makes me ponder how we pray. If everything we pray for is just for our own satisfaction, or if our heart is ready to give back to God. Immediately what he gives to us. For his use and his purpose. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. And I was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And he said to, to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wallet. <laughs> There's someone who needed to learn how to comfort like us. <laughs> And yet when we are in bitterness of soul, we cause people to misunderstand our heart so they don't respond the way we need them to. Because a bitterness of soul lacks humility. Of course, she just took the misunderstanding with Samuel and with, uh, with Eli and she just kept on praying. Over in verse 24, of course she conceived and gave birth to a child. And in verse 24, it says, after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. You'd think it was going to be enough that she gave her just her child. No, she, she gave her full offering to the Lord. These are all the prescribed items to sacrifice. And yet he was given over to the priesthood. Right here, sit, Hannah sacrifices her relationship with her one and only son. Wow. To entrust him to the Lord, which would make Samuel one of the greatest priests of all time. See, it takes great sacrifice to make great impact. There are no shortcuts to greatness or great impact. Just think about that ride to give her son up, what that must have been like. So often we'll ride in the car and there's just silence. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to feel. Imagine that. There was no air conditioning. There was no leather seats. There were no shock absorbers on the wheels or whatever they rode on. <coughs> what a journey. A journey to give sacrifice. Go to, back to Isaiah, verse 43. <coughs> What was sacrificed for you by your mother? By your mother figure? See, the things that you, that come to mind that you think about, those things are only the things you can remember. It's like the tip of the iceberg of the sacrifices made for you. Yeah. Your mother, or mother figure, has sacrificed for you in ways that you will never know. Yeah. Yeah. In ways you probably don't want to know because it was so hurtful or harmful for her. 
See, Hannah sacrificed her one and only child, her money, and her pets, and her food, to, to give her son up. In Isaiah 43, verse 4, we get really uncomfortable when we understand this. Because many of us get to a place where we are not willing to sacrifice. Come on, bro. We're so concerned about ourselves. We've so forgotten the lessons of our mother's sacrifices for us. Come on, bro. That we don't want to hear this. We don't want to own it. We don't want to take responsibility for what God does here for us. It says, Since you are precious and honored in my sight and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you. And people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, <laughs> whom I formed in me. Hannah teaches us greatness by sacrificing her one and only son. So God gave her many. I think Hannah knew that she had to give one up to have many. See, your mother is imitating the Lord when she sacrifices for you. Yeah. There are more single moms in this world than at any other time in history. Working multiple jobs. Trying to play the role of mother and father, which God doesn't allow to happen fully. Come on, Ryan. See, we look at the cross and we say, Jesus died for me. And of course, that is the most pivotal moment in all history. Of course. And yet, we fail to see that God not only gave up His one and only Son, every person that's not made it to heaven, that's died, that won't be with God, was given up for you. Come on. They are all a lesson of what not to do, what choices not to make, what path not to go down. You think every soul isn't a child of God's? He sacrificed, he allowed them to die so that you will make it. Come on, Ryan. See, Hannah understood that. Hannah understood the sacrifice it took to save many souls. And yet God started it. The first one he gave up, Cain. Yeah. That was the first soul given in exchange for you. Yeah. So that you would not hate your brother. Come on. Amen. I think of the things my own mother sacrificed for me. In my childhood, she was severely abused by my father. And yet she stayed. I was, it was the source of my deepest bitterness toward my mom. That she stayed. Because it meant I had to own the fact she did it for me. Come on, Brian. She sacrificed safety, dignity. 
everything she had. Yeah. So I have a dad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that I had my dad in my life. I didn't need him. Yeah. She didn't need all that. Yeah. <laughs> But I know she took it from me. Yeah. What are you going to sacrifice? Come on, for the Lord. How are you going to live like Hannah and sacrifice the little tiny thing that is so important to you yeah. that will bring so much more in your life if you just give it up? See, the very lesson I learned from my mother helped me to win my father's heart. Him and I talk every week, several times a week. I hug him. I kiss him every time I see him. There's honor. There's respect. There's no way that would have happened without my mom's sacrifice. I love you with all my heart. See, a mother will sacrifice anything she needs to so her child will have success and be safe. Yeah. You know, when, uh, when Tracy and I got married, here it comes. <laughs> when we got married, my, our, my, father, my father and her father had a bet. <laughs> They bet fifty dollars. Okay. Her dad started that one, and uh, he bet my dad. My dad said something about kids, and her dad said, "Oh no, heck no, that ain't never happened." My, 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 my girl, she does not want kids. Wish that would have come out in the marriage counseling, but. <laughs> It all eventually comes out in the water. <laughs> so they bet $50 that we'd never have kids. Oh, <laughs> and then, of course, six months in, by decision, Tracy was pregnant. Her heart had changed. See, I married a diva. <laughs> <laughs> but then she became a mom. Oh, yeah. Isn't it crazy how the divas of this world become less diva when they have children? Because God created mothers in a particular way, and moms just kind of fall in place. And when we got married, Tracy didn't clean. She didn't cook. There was gonna be there was gonna be a maid that did all that in her mind. And yet, and yet, she grew up in a home with no dad. Five sisters. And none of them cooked. <laughs> and yet my wife brought herself up out of it. Yeah, come on, crazy. <laughs> and she became a sacrificial person. He saw that all of the goals that were selfish dissipate from her life. She had a strong desire to be a recording artist. And she had what it took. She had the talent, she had the looks, everything. But once once we decided to have children, she took that dream and she sacrificed it. Yeah, come on. To become a stay-at-home mom. And she learned how to cook. She learned how to clean. And she's raised two incredible boys.
and as we grow older together, we'll have our 20 year, uh, 20 year wedding anniversary here in the world. As we grow older together every year, I see my wife become more and more righteous. Come on, Tracy. And soft. It, it's, it's been an amazing thing to watch you grow. But, see, we should want to sacrifice just like God sacrificed for us. In fact, when we don't, it's because we don't know or not in touch with how much God has sacrificed for us. We want to be able to feel and touch and talk to those who sacrifice for us before we'll acknowledge them. Yeah. I, thought the, I thought the contribution that Janice and, and Josiah did was so profound. Yeah. And she's right. None of us know all these people that 38 years ago began selling their homes and their wedding rings and all of these things. So that we can be here. Come on. You can and you should learn from your mother how to sacrifice just like Jesus. Yeah. Thirdly, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. <laughs> The most impacting men of history all claim to multitask. <laughs> they can get so much done because of their great multitasking skills. And I put before you, there is no man that ever walked the planet that can multitask like every mother does. Okay. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, in verse 5, Paul says to Timothy, but you, and I think we can read this and go, okay, this was written to the evangelist of the church, so it doesn't, it's not for me, and yet, if that were true, God would have a book of the leaders, and it would just be all the things for the leaders. Right. And yet this scripture is for you. Right. Come on. But you, keep your head in all situations. Right. Ooh. Ooh. Endure hardship. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Come on, bro. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. Paul's in touch with how much it hurts to lay your life down. Yeah. See, Jesus drank the cup. Paul was poured out. And the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous judge will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also for all who have longed for his appearing. See, this St. Paul that called us to love like a mother loves her little children also teaches how to multitask like brothers multitask. See, it's true, great leaders must multitask to be effective and make impact. And yet Paul poured himself out. It, it's, it's not enough to just juggle many balls. Right? Have this one going. Plate spinning here, that going. It's not enough to just do that. There's a particular heart behind doing it. Yeah. And usually when, the more plates we get, the more... <gasps> right. <laughs> yeah. And then you get into fellowship, and everybody's like, hey! Because <laughs> we get 
so overwhelmed? Because we fail to learn how to multitask from mom. It's, 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 an, it's an incredible thing. The, the person who wants to multitask just needs to go to a single mom's home for it. Right? I mean, you single moms blow my You would think that the child was physically attached, like right here. <laughs> that no arm was needed to hold the child in place. Oh. Because that hand's like stirring. This one's on the phone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, encourage somebody, cook dinner, and clean all at the same time while holding the baby. Right. Wow. <laughs> But see, your multitasking can only be effective if you have the same heart as that. Which is whatever it takes. Yeah. Right. Come on, Ryan. Not embittered. Yeah. A mom may give in to bitterness about life situations, but never in taking care of her child. Yeah. Right. Huh. A mother may be very emotional and all over the place. <laughs> I know none of you are like that, but some of you are. <laughs> and yet, while they can be all over the place, oh, let that child be in danger and see how she keeps her head. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? There's no one that knows what to do except mom when, oh, yeah. are so so when it comes to the safety of their child. Right? If paramedics are there, mom's right in the middle of it. <laughs> and she's more qualified than that paramedic. <laughs> and that's what to do. <laughs> And they'll stand right over that expert paramedic and tell him exactly what to do and how to do it. And her head's right in the game. <laughs> See, we lose focus. And we're all over the place. Mom's like laser focused. That cut, right? No, don't put that bandaid on like that. No, no, no. You put it on and then you kiss it. fire down on the, on the dinner. You have, that, you have that child back here by name. See, it is through their example of love that we learn effectiveness. That we learn to get to the heart. That we learn how to work smarter, not, hard, not just harder. And that's what grabs the heart. I know in... Uh, in our in our 20 years of marriage, I'd come home, I'd come home from work, and uh, and it's funny the boys would usually be playing, and, and I'd come to greet them, and be like, "Hey, Dad, where's Mom?" Right. <laughs> You've been with her all day. Because <laughs> they just know I'm going to give them a chore or some work or, or something, you know? And, and, and we, had, we had our dog for a number of years, Jackson, and, and even the dog. <laughs> Come in, the dog would be like, <laughs> over to Mom. <laughs> No matter where a mother starts off at, she learns to do everything necessary, all at once if needed, in order to protect and take care of her. In the end, if we would just take a single mom out to lunch and learn from her, we'd learn a whole lot more about being a factor. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to focus on Jacobin. Let's go to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter. At the very end of the chapter, in verse 22, the last teaching that we get from our mothers on greatness is the willingness to go anywhere, to do anything, and to give up everything. Yeah, come on. That's it. 
Exodus 1, verse 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Every mom's worst nightmare. Someone coming to kill her child. <coughs> As we move on to chapter 2 here, verse 1, it says, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. We know that woman to be Jacob. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a packer's basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to her. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to greet it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? What a smart young girl. Wow. Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took it to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Jacobed was such a, a brave and selfless woman. Can you imagine giving up your child? But you know, when you cannot outgive God. There's nothing you can give to God that He won't just turn around and outgive you back. And just like Hannah gave up her child, here Jacobin gives up hers. You know, the Bible is full of people giving up their children. Abraham was ready to do it. Jacobin did it. Hannah did it. And God did it. And yet, this is how God rolls. I'm only half black. I don't say it totally right. But this is how this is how our God works. She gives him up. He goes out of her sight just long enough that the sister, God just puts in her heart. <laughs> that, that lady's gonna take him. But he needs to be nursed. <laughs> I can get I can get my brother back for my heart. And so Jacob had not only gave him up, but she not only got him back, but she got paid for doing it. <laughs> That's how God wrote. <laughs> you know, I get some crazy ideas different times. I've done a lot of crazy things in my life. And yet, Tracy's always been ready. At every point. Tracy's always ready to do whatever it is, go anywhere, give up anything. When our family of churches fell apart, and Tracy and I were out in Riverside, just in the middle of what I said wasn't, this is not my church anymore. This is not the church I got baptized in. And when I found that church, I remember calling her after service and saying, are you ready to move? Yes. Right away. Not even a hesitation. 
Not even a hesitation. And two weeks later, we were in Fort Worth. Then it came to light that there were many here in LA that wanted to reignite the church. And we helped start that here. But really, I started the corporation and and did the first sermon and started the church off. And then, but then we just, but then we went back to Portland because that's where we were living at the time. But then, nine weeks after we moved, he asked, "Hey, can you go back down and leave that thing until the team gets there?" And Tracy was like, "Sure, let's go." Then we were asked two years later to go back to Portland. <laughs> now that one she was like, hold on a minute. I just need some time to pray. And then on the way home from there, we made the phone call. We're ready to go. And then we were asked to go to Washington, D.C. And she was fired up to go do that. At every point, no matter where we need to go, no matter what we need to do, Tracy's ready. Yeah. And she gives her heart deeply. But not only has Tracy raised our two sons, she has spiritual children all over the kingdom. Yeah. I can think of three church leaders right now that are daughters of Tracy. And you're just a phenomenal woman to all people. I'm so blessed to have this as you have you as my But you know, being a mom teaches you. And being a mom and taught Tracy. So when Tracy got baptized, there is no man that can do anything right. <laughs> and yet she has two boys who can do no wrong. Because being a mother changes your heart and your feelings. It is not through me, it's through my boys that she's learned to give her heart to men. Come on, Tracy. And today, you know, we have a we have a great mission ahead of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, bro. We're in the year where we will see the completion of phase one of our plan to yeah. evangelize. Yeah. And I will just say, because there are financially challenging times for many. That there's been more resistance to giving to this than any other time I've seen in 24 years ever. Yeah, yeah. And I think, like Hannah, like Jacobin, like my mother and my wife, and like so many of you here, every mother that's amongst us, we've got to learn it takes great sacrifice to make it. Come on, right? yep, come on. That's it. We've got to learn and trust that if we give to God, He gives more back. Let's not be Lot who had to survey the land before he chose what to do. Yeah. Let us be Abraham who said, I just give up everything and whatever you give me is fine with me. Yeah. We have special missions next Sunday. <laughs> Jesus praised the woman who gave two copper coins. Just... I've made a lot of phone calls this week to many of you. And many of those phone calls went unanswered. Those text messages were not replied to. Yeah. Yeah. And I think many of us miss the heart of special missions. Yeah, come on, bro. Yeah, come on, bro. I don't care what amount you give, I really don't. I care that you give with the heart of these women the other day. Yeah. That's what I care about. Yeah. Because giving is good for you. 
Oh yeah, come on. We know, we all say it, it's better to give than to receive. <laughs> Until it's time to give. <laughs> uh -oh. And I, I want to ask you men, please show respect when I contact you. Or return my call or my text. I am not your enemy. I'm not trying to drag things out of you. I have friends and families. They're your friends and families that are out there relying on what we give. Yep. I'm trying to find out if you're not going to give what's needed, how much more I have to do to make sure they get fed. Come on, Ryan. And I need you to call me back. I'm not going to look down for one second on what I'm out for. I, I, will, I will call you to do your best if I don't think that's what you're doing. Yeah. But I don't care the amount. I just care that you give your best. Yeah. But if, if all of our best doesn't meet the need, I'm going to keep going until I hit the need. And that's what, I, that's what I need. Let's not be those people who, are, who disrespect each other and shun one another's communication. Yes, bro. Come on. Right. Because then it, then it just makes it all the harder at the last second. Yep. I'll go do it as many things as I need to do, sell as many things as I need to sell or whatever, to make sure Kyle and Andrew and Oleg and, and Raul down in South America, all these people have what they need so they don't have to come back. We didn't send them to bring them back. Yeah. We sent them to, to win those countries. Yeah. Come on, that's yeah. fine. And this week and next week, let's give like that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's sacrifice. Mothers teach us to comfort like God. They teach us to sacrifice like Jesus. They show us with their example how to be the multitaskers that win this world. And they teach us the, the essential part of being willing to go anywhere give up anything, and do everything for Jesus. This morning, take a lesson from moms, the teaching on greatness. I love you guys.